I am Alex Cornelius from Maynard, Georgia. I am a uh, blueberry farmer that uh, we grow about 200 acres of blueberries. And if y'all heard Dr. Phil earlier say that we're not too far from Georgia, you'll take these gentlemen's numbers of 24,000 pounds to the acre of blackberries and multiply it times the $16 a pound that the other one was selling it for, and that's what you go home and count your money to plan on planting blackberries and raspberries. That, that's what we usually do, take the wrong number, get everything confused, and then make it look good on paper. <laughs> we'll misquote everybody. That's, that's what happens at home. Um, as of 2014, Georgia is the leading blueberry producer. It is unbelievable. I can remember back in the late 80s when we were producing less than 10 million pounds per year. Um, our, our annual meetings would not have this many people in it. I mean, I know y'all sitting here saying nothing, well, it, nothing could ever happen like that in Virginia. You don't know. Um, we were making more money per pound back when it was a lot less. Um, but Georgia did produce 96 million pounds last year. Uh, Alma, they consider themselves the blueberry capital of Georgia. They were a, um, a grant city that received some money back in the 70s for harvesters, and, and that's what got them rolling into the blueberry business. We were growing, doing okay in the late 90s. Um, Dr. Jim Joseph done research um, that was funded by the U.S. Highbush Council. Is money that we pay in when you sell blueberries, and he done the research and come out with all the positive health benefits on antioxidants, and and that's what really boosted the blueberry industry. Now this is all my opinion. This is not factual, but this is what I feel like happened, and things have continued to grow since then. Um, along the same time, marketers started looking to the Chilean production. They went south to South America to get a 12-month program. And that's when blueberries started being in the shelves, on the shelf, 12 months out of the year. Um, and eventually, a lot of marketers merged with the Chilean producers. My wife and I got married in 1986. The two girls are mine, the two boys are my brothers, and my sister-in-law. We farmed together until 2006, and we divided up the farm. We didn't have any problems. We just... We had grew from uh, 17 acres in 89 to 61 and 93. To by 2006, we were probably at 150 acres. The little blonde here is my baby girl right here now. <laughs> She's a dental hygienist, but she helps daddy on Monday and Fridays. And this is her cousin that lives in Virginia that drove over to meet us. So, um, Just some of the highlights back then, in 1996, we lost 80% um, of our crop on March 13th, the storm of the century that came through. I don't know if, as farmers, you remember certain things, and that was one of the things. A gentleman named Jerry Vanderwegen was the one that was very instrumental in bringing high bush to our area. Uh, Dr. Phil mentioned earlier V1. That was bootlegged somewhat into Georgia. It was named after Vanderwegen, that one. But some of those little things, looking back now, 30 years ago, started the ball rolling. We realized that we could produce berries early in the year. In the 90s, you couldn't borrow money from bankers, um, not for farming. But you, you, it just didn't happen. The um, high bush and rabbit eyes were doing well. By the years 2003, 2006, the bankers would come out and they would loan you money. Three years, all you had to do was pay the interest and then the fourth year start paying the principal. So that put a lot of people in the blueberry business that shouldn't have been in the blueberry business. I mean, that's, you have to think about that. Sometimes people, if you can get money and you're doing, that doesn't mean you should. Um, a hard freeze on Easter morning, 2007. On April 8th, we lost about 75% of our crop in 07. Uh, 2008, we came back with a big crop, but the price had gotten cheap. But we survived. Um, Around 2012, some of the marketing companies was are producing a ready-to-eat product that was putting McDonald's, a blueberry and McDonald's oatmeal. Now there are blueberries ready to eat in packets in Starbucks, and I'm not sure if y'all have Chick-fil-A's in this area. Yes, sir. 
If you go to Chick-fil-A's, they've replaced the grapes with blueberries. And that's, that's all good stuff. The owner of Chick-fil-A is from Georgia, and he is a, a, he's a blueberry fanatic. He loves it. And everybody's looking at the health benefits. <coughs> Um, reason for planting, same question as asked a while ago, we, um, is natural to our soul. Um, we're about four hours south of Atlanta, hour north of Jacksonville, Florida. If we had it on the map, there's 500,000 acres there called the Okefenokee Swamp. And we live just about 15 miles north of that. Um, land prep. And Dr. Rafi had asked me to speak on what we do at our nursery farm. We do this type of land clearing. I guess to get to know us, this is what all we've done to get where our nursery's at. The, um, when you're clearing up your land, uh, Dr. Eric had touched on everything from the planting on, but he didn't touch on the land clearing. Uh, traditional larger acreage, or four acres or two acres, you clear the stumps. You don't want to burn that stuff on site. You don't want ashes. If you dig them, you haul them out to the edge. If you do burn it on site, pick your ashes up and get them out of there. Um, the grinding method is something that started around the early 2000s. And um, this is us actually taking out some old established blueberries. But that machine will go through a stump forest. Uh, we have a lot of plantations where they're planted 12 feet apart, six foot in a row, and that machine will, will straddle the stump row and grind and incorporate everything into the dirt. And when you get through, you're ready to start hairing. We come along behind it with the hairs and a uh, large leveling box plate or plane. You don't want to move too much topsoil. I mean, when we go to level, and you guys, y'all, you're different up here. When I say we're flat, I mean we're we're flat. <laughs> yeah, I don't, when y'all, you got the terrace, and I don't know how y'all stay, keep from washing away. But anyhow, <laughs> we want everything level. Don't want to move a lot of the topsoil. And somebody earlier today mentioned we started using GPS to lay off the roads. But we've got neighbors that's farmers, and we can get their tractors and work out, swap out deals, and, and you can lay those roads off within an inch of each other. And, and I, now some of the, we're starting to put the GPS on some of the harvesters. So, um, our high bush spacing is generally 9 to 11 feet, rabbit eyes 10 to 12. If you've got a hard pan underneath, we recommend that you subsoil it, bust it up with a ripper underneath the bed. On irrigation, we certainly, on everything we've got, we've got drip irrigation. We use it for uh, injecting the fertilizers. Um, you, you just, the drip irrigation is what's going to take you through your crop growth and your harvest. I'm always do as I say, not as I've always done. Because of cash flow, we do not always put in overhead irrigation up front because that cost us about $5,000 an acre now. Uh, if you do it right, from the, if you include pumps or wells or ponds or whatever, um, it is cheaper to do it up front. Because every time you come back later, it never is cheaper and the cost of everything goes up more. For frost protection, we're using between 0.25 and 3 tenths of an inch of water per hour. Some systems as high as half an inch. North Carolina generally goes with like 0.15 for just frost protection. Um, today, two weeks ago, we uh, I wish we had the video of our farm. We had about 100 acres that was iced down. Some of the fields we ran for two days. We had a freeze event that came in. Thursday morning we got down to 28. And then by Friday morning, we was at 19 and 20 and 21 in different fields. And uh, we lost about 35% of our high bush crop that morning. Uh, probably 15% of it stripped off whenever the ice, when the plants stood back up from the ice weighting them down, the berries and blooms stripped off. So, but we still got a, we got a good chance of, you can lose 35% sometimes and still make it up in size and, and you can pay the bills. 
a rabbit I crop, which has not lost anything so far, looks real good in Georgia today. It did yesterday when we left, anyhow. <laughs> Subject to change. Um, when you're planting, somebody said order plants a year ahead, I say you should have ordered them two years ago. Um, and reputable license. Tissue culture was mentioned. I think tissue cultures that we've tested, tissue culture versus propagation. Tissues, they can come virus free, but when you've got the bugs and stuff that's out flying around and, and pruners is moving from one place to the next, it's not always going to stay virus free. If it's there, it's there. Bithium, rhizop, all that is in the soil anyhow. Um, certain varieties, certain old varieties, the Premier, Brightwells, Tiff Blue, Climax, a lot of those are no, no royalties are due on those. Anybody can take cuttings, grow them, do what they want to. Most of the newer varieties have a royalty, and whoever you're buying it from needs to be a licensed grower. And they need to be collecting the royalties and turning it in. Um, and this is probably Greek to a lot of y'all, but if you're buying plants, um, all the new University of Georgia varieties, all the new Florida varieties, there is a royalty that goes with every plant that goes back to the universities to help fund that system so we can get more plants. It's a good thing. Uh, the universities are getting their money cut back and they're looking to royalties to help fund these programs going forward. Varieties like Legacy are released by the USDA and Prince released by the USDA. They are not required to have royalty. The high bush versus rabbit eye, they've already went over a lot of that today. Um, you're going to return more money. And when some of the gentlemen were recommending early, ask them what they, how early is early. What, um, if you get out there with the rebel or some of these varieties, you're going to be in a situation we were in last week. You're, you're going to be exposed during the frost and freezes more. But you're going to be rewarded more whenever you come through it. Um, and I don't know if y'all realized, um, Eric Smith earlier had quoted Gerard Crewer, Southern high bush is a plant looking for a place to die. <laughs> That's one of his famous quotes, and we all quote him on that. Uh, rabbit eyes, I think for you pick operations, I don't think you, you can't um, beat how hardy the plant is. You can't beat the quality of the, of the berry, um, flavor of the berry. And I don't know if there's anybody that does any mechanical harvesting. There will be one day. I know y'all say no, never, but there will probably be one day mechanical harvesting in Virginia. Um, rabbit eyes are a little more forgiving on that. They'll grow in soils that's not as... as um, that's good. The high bush is going to, the high bush is a little more finicky. Um, and they're generally made for um, for shipping more distance. And when we talk about high bush in Georgia, we're speaking of the southern high bush. The past few years we started getting into the legacy, which is a northern high bush. But um, for the most part we're referring to um, this list of high bush is all southern high bush is what we grow in Georgia. Um, to save time, I'm not going to go through each one, every detail by detail. Camellia is one that's really showed out in the past few years. It blooms later and been having a real heavy production. It's hard not to go through every one of them. <laughs> um, Emerald's old producer that's been around forever. It blooms early. You're going to have to worry about it. Um, freeze protecting it, but it's going to make berries. Rebel is a real, it's the earliest thing that we have. It's a good berry, but it's a blah taste. Uh, Susie Blue, everything's good about it. It's just going to come in more around the camellia. Sweet Crisp is one of the best, the best tasting berries out there, but the production is low. Star is a standby that we've had forever. One of the first original high bushes that was released in the early 90s. Farthing was mentioned earlier today. Um, it's going to have a green back. That's the one that's got a good heavy crop, good producer. 
but it's going to have a green tint to one end of it when you pick it. Uh, metal art, a lot of good stuff about it, but it's been showing up some problems in the past couple of years with some um, disease problems. Kestrel, I don't know, unless you're as close to the coast here, I don't think I'd recommend Kestrel. It's, it blooms early and it's going to get its feelings hurt. It'll stick its head out there early and it's going to get hurt probably. If you got, have you a test plot? If it's two plants or 10 plants or 20 plants, yeah. like they were saying a while ago, try them. What you do on your longitude and latitude may be different than your neighbor. Your dirt <coughs> system. And it's, you know, it's not going to break you to buy five or 10 plants. If you're a bigger farmer, put a half acre out there to give it a chance. Um, rabbit eye, lava hole. Or anybody, does anybody grow rabbit eyes? Are y'all growing a lot of the early ones or any of these? Bright World, Powder Blue, Premier. Okay, so y'all are familiar with a lot of the, the ones that we've had, the good standbys. The newer ones are the Lapa Hall. It's a heavy producer, but it's a small berry. Austin, uh, Austin has been a good... It'll come back to uh, Austin has been a good producer. It, it makes a nice size berry, but it... I really wouldn't plant it because it's got the reputation for being seedy and the skin being thick. I don't think that it's necessarily fair to Austin, but that's that's what's happened. Um, powder Blue, Brightwell, those standbys, they've been here forever. They're good proven varieties. Oglockney is one of the newer ones that's came in. It comes in later. But the two main ones that I want you to really pay attention to that's new and out is the Titan and then some, one that's not been talked about very much is a variety called a Prince. And Prince was released, released by um, USDA out of Poplarville, Mississippi, under that program. Um, Titan, nothing is ever bad said about Titan, but it will rain split. We're just hoping it's going to come in in a time in Georgia that it's not raining as much as the last week of May, we're less apt to have rains as we are the first, second, third week of June. And so maybe we can get tightened in and get it out and do okay, but it will split, which all rabbit eyes will split. Some just worse than others. A lap of hall would be your least likely to split, but you're looking at a small berry. Prince is showing some real good production. It's just, it's a woolly plant that's not going to machine harvest very well. It just, it grows grows wild and wicked just everywhere, but it's a heavy producer. Um, <coughs> the reason we started our nursery, my brother and I were together, we couldn't find the plants that we wanted. Um, first few years we grew our own plants and then we started selling to our neighbors. And then we started taking on additional orders and in 2009 we hired a, a we were very blessed that a man named Nathan Baldwin came to work at, with us, a young man. Uh, he's doing good. We finally got us a website up and going, and uh, we're still learning how to do small orders. We, um, it's different. It's, it's, it's different. It, it, we, we do pretty good with uh, growing our blueberries and our packing facility and all, and growing our plants. But the new challenge is taking care of the smaller orders with the website and everything that we've got up and going. Uh, this is the posted prices that we put out there. Um, and if you go to our website, corneliusfarms.com, they're all listed on there. Um, and I'm going to get my niece and my daughter to hand out a little card that we found is very, very helpful. Um, I don't know, how many of y'all are familiar with the stages one through seven? When somebody says stage one of a blueberry or stage two, if you're talking with one of the doctors or somebody about um, when to spray or what bloom stage you're in, this will help help explain it. Um, in Georgia, they're constantly referring to different stages. Yeah, I'll get it. Um, and also at the bottom of this, 
I usually keep one of these on the pickup. The University of Georgia used to produce this, and I kept it on my pickup truck all the time. And I thought it's a, it's a good way to advertise, get our name out, and this is a handy little sheet. If you call Dr. Rafi and he goes to asking you what stage of bloom are you in, you can look on here and you can go to talking and nailing it down to the same same general idea. Uh, of course, y'all are smarter here in Virginia, and y'all can communicate over the phone with the hands telling him which blooms is here and there, and how big they are, better than what we can. So, and this little tiny, no, they're small. They're not real big. So, so and if he'll get him one, and this is on the website. But I will tell you, like. North Carolina and parts of Michigan, some, everybody does not use this exact same thing. We do, and I've talked to Virginia, and everybody's on the same thing, page with that. If you went to North Carolina, some of their stages in the middle would be a little bit different. That's kind of like North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> That's North Carolina, okay. Uh, and I am not a speaker, but Lord, thank you, I made it. So. <laughs>